My name is David Britton. I've been a member of Grace Bible Church for almost a decade. Um, I've been asked by our elders to present on the foster care crisis in Arizona. And uh, my world has really collided with with being a foster care licensing worker uh, for my agency, Arizona Faith and Families, as well as a foster and adoptive father and uh, serving in NGM ministry. Um, so I'm really thankful for this opportunity that's been given to me by our elders to speak to you today. Over the course of this equipping hour, I hope to provide you a reason for this equipping hour teaching, an overview of what foster care is and isn't, and some application questions for each of us to consider. I wanted to just do a little intro with um, some quotes from this book of the month, Hospitality Commands. I uh, have coined foster care a while back as radical hospitality. Um, because it's not just a meal. It's not uh, just going out of your way to open up your home to somebody uh, for a weekend or um, an evening, blessing them in different ways. But uh, I knew that this book would would have some connections, and so I wanted to start with this. Um, A few quotes. Alexander Strauch says, What does hospitality have to do with religion? Well, really, he he starts off in chapter 2 with, well, it starts with the household of faith, being devoted to one another in brotherly love. So an emphasis on Christians demonstrating hospitality towards fellow believers. And then he goes on to talk about spreading to unbelievers to strangers. Um, One quote that seemed to stick out more than others was was this one. If you erase hospitality and put in foster care, it seems to fit. Hospitality fleshes out love in a uniquely personal and sacrificial way. Through the ministry of hospitality, we share our most prized possessions. We share our family, home, Finances, food, privacy, and time. Indeed, we share our very lives. And quoting Jesus in Luke 14, 14, talking about hospitality to to those who can't repay. He says, you will be blessed since they do not have the means to repay you. So there's a lot of connections between just growing in our heart of hospitality towards others and uh, growing into consideration of how we might meet needs in the foster care world. But let's pray and, and ask God to help us today. Our Father... We thank you for your saving mission to draw us to you, to provide the sacrifice for sin that we could not provide, and to make us like your son through the power of your Holy Spirit. Make us abound in hope at your soon and certain return. May this message be clear and edifying to your people. May I be accurate with the handling of your word and cause us to grow up into mature manhood and womanhood by what is said this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So as I said, it's the intent of our elders at this time that this church body be informed of the realities and opportunities in front of us with the high number of children in foster care in Arizona and the consistent and ongoing need for support for these children. I want to explain how today's quipping hour was placed on the agenda by our elders. With every decision made, there are ramifications. On June 24th, 2022, the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. After nearly 50 years of a constitutional right to abortion, 
our current Supreme Court overturned this 1973 ruling. This did not end abortion. As we know, abortion is the ending, the termination of a life inside of a mother, either by medicinal or surgical means. But it did not end abortion. It only stated that, quote, the Constitution does not confer a right to abortion, and the authority to regulate abortion is returned to the people and their elected representatives. That means that state by state, the legality or illegality of abortion and restrictions upon abortion will be regulated by each state individually. Within days, our elders were meeting together and conferring what this means for leading and serving our body. How can we at GBC be prepared to meet needs as a result of this ruling? Specifically, a prayer led by Smedley the Sunday after this overturn encapsulated our request as a church as he prayed that God would pave the way for gospel proclamation, that we, the beholders of truth, would go with light and love and compassion, eager to meet pressing needs, and that the church would be fertile ground for love and open arms and compassion for women who have found themselves with child. At that time, I was invited to provide a report on adoption process and possibilities to help equip our elders with various ways that we can step in to the need as a church. This was an exemplary step of proactive shepherding by our elders to be equipped to respond in a practical and biblical way to such a need as they sought to be ready for every good work. In fact, I just followed up with an adoption agency, um, somebody who works specifically with private adoptions, who I talked with back in June. And they said, thank you for calling again, David, and checking in. She said, when Roe versus Wade was overturned, I thought I was going to get a flood of churches calling and asking and wanting to get information. And your church is the only church that reached out. We've had some women who have decided to adopt, uh, put their child up for adoption because of the Roe versus Wade overturn, but it hasn't increased much. That was just recently this week with my check-in with her. Back to why we're here. As this theme of children in need and women in crisis has been something that my wife and I have been entrenched in for a couple decades through foster care and adoption, I was given the opportunity to state my case of one of the primary ramifications of the overturn of Roe versus Wade. I believe that while there may be a slight increase in women in America willing to give their child up for adoption, the greatest need as a result of the Supreme Court ruling will be an increase in the already unmet demand for foster homes and adoptive homes for children in the Department of Child Safety system. This is because a significant number of these women are going to try and parent their child, a child whom they may have aborted. And if they are living in an unsafe environment with unsafe people or exposure to drugs in the womb or after the birth of a child, which most know is a deadly and growing national epidemic, what then? What happens to that child or their children? The likelihood of removal from the home by DCS Department of Child Safety. It's increased. And another temporary home will be sought while the birth mother is given months or sometimes up to two years or more to take the steps the state demands she take to have her child return to her. Let me repeat one point. There was already an urgent need for foster homes for children from newborn to 17 years old for decades before this reversal of Roe versus Wade. There was and continues to be an unmet demand for foster homes. The blessing is that many children who might not have been born in a state when access to abortion was easier will now be born. The tragedy and opportunity is that many of these children will end up as foster children due to neglect or abuse. And someone will have the opportunity to respond 
to take responsibility and take care of these children for as long as needed until a permanent solution is decided upon. Will it be a relative, an aunt, an uncle, grandparent? Perhaps you know of someone who already is serving in this kinship role as foster parent for a niece, a nephew, or a grandchild. Will it be a close friend? Will you develop a bond with a coworker, a friend of a friend, and suddenly find yourself asked if you would serve as a foster family? Or could you find yourself beginning to consider if your household is qualified and faith-filled to serve an urgent need as foster family or a foster to adopt family? Today is to make you aware of foster care in Arizona and to ask you to begin to think of how God may allow you to use the gifts he has given you to participate in some way in this ongoing urgent need. In a sense, this is a foster care 101 equipping hour. I wanna give biblical anchors for thinking about foster care as well as answers to questions that may be going through your mind, questions common to men and women, to Christians thinking about this with sober-mindedness and biblically bolstered. We will talk about the following. Realities of foster care in our midst at Grace Bible Church, frequently asked questions and frequently wrong assumptions. We will point out some painful realities of foster care, and we will point up to the blessed benefits and gospel opportunities for those who choose to serve in this ongoing need. By the end of this equipping hour, my hope is that you would see how the church is uniquely positioned to step into this itinerant or, or permanent mission field, and that this will affect your prayer life, your concern, and your consideration of ways you can use your gifts to serve in this good work or any good work that God has prepared in advance for you to walk in, Ephesians 2.10. But let's begin with one passage of scripture that comes to mind when you talk about foster care or adoption or foster to adopt. Uh, you probably have memorized it without even trying. 127, James 127. If you wanna look at it, we'll look at that briefly. James 127 says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. The word religion has got a bad rap in the last century. It certainly was not used by James here in a negative light. He was commending to us a way that a sanctified life a set-apart life results in an active and fruit-bearing faith, a faith that is put into practice. It was a word in the first century that had to do with outward expression of worship. But it isn't just the word religion that's gotten a bad rap. The verse itself, James 1.27, has gotten a bad rap as well. It has been the victim of abuse and neglect. One proof of neglect is that some give no attempt to explain to visit. This is the same word used a few times by Luke. First in Luke 168, it's used in the prophecy of Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, when he said, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. Luke 17, 716 says, after Jesus raised a widow's son, the people declared, God has visited his people in sending Jesus to them. It's also used in declaring God's drawing in the Gentiles and granting them the gift of repentance and faith in Acts 15, 14. This visiting is in meeting desperate needs. He grants the answer to an enduring prayer for a child to Zechariah and Elizabeth. He provides a physical resurrection to a widow's son, and he grants salvation to Gentiles through the pre preaching of the gospel. It is a visitation that meets desperate and hopeless circumstances. This is God's visitation plan. 
and pure and undefiled religion visits orphans and widows in their distress. A second point of neglect is that often this verse is upheld without speaking of it in context. It precedes exhortations against practicing partiality, treating visitors to our assembly different based on their clothing or social status in James chapter 2. It also, surprisingly, follows James 126, which lays out the first of three ways that pure and undefiled religion is often neglected, which is in the absence of bridling the tongue. Reading both together, if any, verse 26 and 27, if anyone thinks his, he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. God's word is teaching us to check our claim of genuine saving faith in our words, in our compassion for widow and orphan, and our learning to live in the world without being stained by the world. James 127 is also often abused, used beyond authorial intent as the evidence beyond all evidences of a genuine faith, concern for widows and orphans. As if God was making it so simple for us that he wanted to remove his long-standing Old Testament mandate of mercy towards the sojourner, the alien, the stranger, the one who was dwelling among God's people in God's land. There were three sets of people in need throughout the history of our Bible, which God put together in a three-chord strand, time after time for his people to show mercy towards. Strangers or sojourners, widows, and the fatherless. One prime example is in Deuteronomy chapter 10. After the Lord exhorts his people through Moses to circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn, Moses says of the Lord, that he executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Many other passages combine those three together. But the abuse of this text in James 1.27 is to treat James 1.27 as if God is no longer concerned about the sojourner. Is God now only concerned about a specific ex expression or religious practice of a compassionate heart to widows or orphans? No. The Lord is concerned with a compassionate heart through and through. His desire to work in us a growing heart of compassion within. God's glorious goal is Christ-like transformation by increasing degrees. This happens bit by bit day by day, as we have our minds renewed through the truth of his word. This transformation finds expression in tender mercy and loving kindness, particularly to those who are unlikely to be able to reciprocate your generosity. It's bigger than foster care in Arizona. It's wider than ministry to widows inside the church and beyond. The compassionate heart of a Christian is going through an ever-expanding heart enlargement as he or she is growing as a disciple of Christ. Therefore, to make the emphasis of James 127 on the practice of orphan and widow care is to miss the authorial intent of James, who through his letter gets to the heart of the matter through real-life examples. A real-life example of Compassion, which is the main point, is care for widows and orphans. James 127 commends two exemplary, exemplary ways, is what I'm saying, to express the heart of compassion. God at work in you. God growing this steadfast love that never ceases his mercies that never come to an end. 
But today is a look at the plight of foster children in Arizona. So I've, I, as I've said, I've coined this as radical hospitality because it has all the hallmarks of hospitality. But it has an investment far beyond a clear biblical definition of hospitality um, with some of those quotes that I alluded to before in, I feel like this is an advertisement. This is an advertisement. The book of the month. The Hospitality Commands by Alexander Strout. Now, what is foster care? It is, it is parental care. Working with a foster agency. The agency is contracted with the state. Every foster care agency is contracted with the state of Arizona to serve families, and they'll foster a child or children. That is, they'll nurture, they'll care for, for a time, and treat that child as their own, yet not ex exercising all rights as a parent. A foster parent acts as a steward and signs a foster family home agreement to abide by reasonable and prudent parenting with the oversight of your selected foster care agency and the state. You take responsibility for the child or children, but that child is not legally bound to you. But what really is foster care in a, a bigger picture? Let's zoom up. How does the whole thing work? Is it just for children who have parents that go to jail? So the state has to find homes for the children because their parents are in jail? Not exactly. Sometimes, yes. But here's a more realistic story that may help the heartbeat of a foster care need. Imagine with me. What if we could see through the walls of the homes in our neighborhood or apart apartment complex? What if we could see and hear the family life? And what if one of 10 homes was not a very happy place to be? A site that would make you want to turn your head at foolishness, faithlessness, heartlessness, or ruthlessness in that home. And what if out of 100 apartments or 100 houses, there were 10 of these not so good, not so safe homes. And what if out of the 10, one was worse than all the others? Things were done and said in that house that if done or said in public, would find a brave, concerned citizen speaking up and attempting to bring attention. That's not acceptable. But they're in a household. And in that household, there are two young children. Eventually, the neglect is bad enough for someone to notice and ask the child questions and to report the concern to the child abuse hotline, 1-888-SOS-CHILD. They are not sure what exactly is going on, but this is out of the norm and somebody needs to find out. The DCS gets the call and an investigation has begun. Individual interviews are conducted with all members of the household, adults separately, children. Concerns are verified. It's worse than was originally reported. And the two children are removed from the home for their own safety. They're taken into custody by the Department of Child Services while the parents are explained their rights and legal process that's now going to begin. A course of correction plan begins to be put in place. This is called a case plan for the parents to follow, to be able to reunify with their children. A short list of next of kin is given to the DCS specialist by the mother for a possible temporary placement of these children, her children. An address and a cell number of a grandparent, a phone number for an aunt who lives across town, and a stepbrother who lives in another state. And what about these children, these, these two children from your neighborhood? They're now sitting in a DCS cubicle, eight by eight, partitioned off, 50 of them in, the, in one office. 
They're sitting there while the DCS specialist attempts to make phone calls and do background checks. These children are wondering where they are and if they'll see their parents again. Will it be tomorrow? Will it be next week? The aunt is not answering her phone. The grandmother said she's willing, but is already struggling with some of her own health concerns and, and a husband who's unwilling to step in and come to the rescue of her daughter again. They won't take these children. The state may pursue the stepbrother in time, the one who lives out of state, but there's no immediate reason to remove the children to another state. And the hope is that these children will soon have two-hour visits with their parents and reunify with their parents once the issues have been sufficiently resolved in the eyes of an Arizona judge. There the children sit. It's now been three hours since they were driven away from their home with a backpack and a makeshift suitcase with some of their clothes and belongings. A placement specialist starts making calls to names of people who have a foster license in Arizona and two beds for siblings. What kind of person would open their home to these total strangers? Why would somebody who's not related and not already invested say, welcome to our home? Who would do such a thing? In Arizona alone, there are 12,000 children who are foster children in need of a foster home. On an average day, 22 children are removed from their home and in need of a temporary placement due to neglect or abuse. Most of these cases are neglect. Kinship homes are sought first, then foster homes. Then if the child has to sleep in a placement center for a few days or up to a week or more, the child will go to a group home. This is called congregate care. This is a home for four or f with four or five bedrooms run by staff that's normally either all boys or all girls and has eight to 12 children in the group home. Some group homes are co-ed to keep siblings together. Sometimes brothers and sisters are separated as they go into foster care because there are not enough homes for sibling groups. This is true in foster care. This is true in group homes. These are the children. This is the crisis. A safe and loving home is the urgent ongoing need. Their faces are not on the front page of the news. They are not at the freeway exit holding a sign or huddled in alleyways. But in the same way that we believe and share the gospel through eyewitness testimony, so also we must take the testimony of trustworthy brothers and sisters in Christ of urgent need, urgent needs when they come our way. I'm asking you to believe me to believe the trusted eyewitness accounts that thousands of these precious children, from newborn to toddlers to teens, have been removed from their parents for their own safety and need a home. They will not knock on your door. Their faces and ages and stories won't be advertised on Facebook or Instagram. For their own safety, they are the anonymous unseen. There's no kiddo podcast, no Instagram update. They need a place to call home. They need mature, stable, patient, parent-like care as their own parents are given the opportunity over the course of months or years to correct the problem that led to their removal. 12,000 children in Arizona, hundreds per week, 22 per day. And you know what about these numbers? They're conservative. Let's talk about some realities of foster care in Arizona. When children are removed from their homes and placed into foster care, 
Nobody can tell how long it will be before permanent, a permanent plan is finalized. The permanent plan in most cases is reunification to the parent. In general, the goal is months, but in reality, a case can often take over a year and sometimes beyond two years. What's the success rate of reunification? Well, we can divide it up into about thirds. About a third of these children will reunify with their birth parent or primary parent. About a third will be placed in a relative or close friend that the family knows. This is called kinship. And about a third of these children will be adopted. If a foster parent chooses not to be an adoptive parent, then the state looks for an adoptive home. The state always tries to keep siblings together in foster care and adoption. And I want to say this now so they don't forget. This is not about foster to adopt, please. This is just about making you aware of foster care. And my family has been greatly blessed by foster families who were committed to foster, but not to adopt. Thanks to those families, we have grown our family and provided a home for beautiful children that my life would not be what it is without. So thank you, foster families who foster only, as well as those who foster to adopt. But back to foster to adopt and how that happens. Why does that happen? If a foster parent is willing to be an adoptive parent, they are the likely candidates, it's not a guarantee, but the likely candidates to gain approval from the state to adopt this foster child. Remember, they've been in the home for months, maybe over a year. So in that year, they haven't gone to kinship during the foster home. Um, often there's, there's not an uncle or aunt fighting and suing the state to, to have this child placed in their home. So this foster family is favorable because they know the child well by this time. After six months in care, they're legally kinship. So that's another plus in their favor. They're also likely because they have invested emotionally and relationally with this child um, and shown themselves to be dependable, reasonable, stable, caring. There's no major hurdles to jump as well to go from foster care to adoption. The labor that one puts in to become a licensed foster parent makes them legally allowed to adopt a child. Another reality is that in our body, we have some parents who have gone through private adoption and many more who have traveled the foster to adoption route. My best count is 12 or more current GBC families who have gone the foster to adoption route and six families who have either adopted through kinship or private adoption. Again, my numbers are conservative. I think it's more. Currently, we have two active foster families in our midst, and at least one who is preparing to enter the process of becoming a foster parent. One of the great blessings of my life to, to walk them through the process as a foster care licensing worker. Our church has partnered with both Christian Family Care and my agency, Arizona Faith and Families, both of these are Christian foster and adoption agencies. GBC supports the Christmas gift program every year, which is headed up by Jenna Kelso. GBC also allows Arizona Faith and Families, the agency I work for, to conduct meetings and foster parent college classes here at our campus to east side families uh, interested in pursuing their foster care license. Families from Scottsdale, Gilbert, Chandler, Tempe, so these are some of the realities of what's going on right here, right now. Just think of that, over two dozen houses, uh, if we were all gathered together, as we will be in an hour, and everybody stood up who was involved as an adoptive parent, a foster parent, a respite parent, and all the children who have been adopted, children who are now not children, who are now adults, it would be something to see.
But here, let's go to uh, next, some frequently asked questions and, and wrong assumptions. One, I can't do it, it costs too much. The cost is in your willingness to take the time to become licensed, not in cold cash. The state wants to facilitate well-suited fa families to get licensed, so there is very little cost, other than first aid and CPR classes, and perhaps a few upgrades to your home, like a smoke alarm in every room for your house. So there's, those are seriously the, the major costs. Time is the cost. Time. You have to go to classes. Uh, five weeks in a row, a three-hour class, plus online training. Every foster parent goes through that. How about this one? How many children are you asking me to take? I'm not asking you to take any. I'm asking that if you have compassion in your heart from God, that it would grow. It would grow outward, and here's one way. But you and your agency determine the best fit for your family regarding the number of children. Of course, there's always a high need for homes who can take sibling groups, but there's no mandate that you do more than you think wise. What about age, gender, physical or behavioral concerns? I can't handle teenagers or toddlers. Well, I'm not changing diapers again. Well, fortunately, uh, as of today, there is still such a thing in the eyes of the state as gender. And you can choose one or the other. You choose the age range, and your licensing agency helps discuss this with you and think biblically about what would be the age range. Well, there are often physical or behavioral effects due to trauma of being removed from the home. A child with severe developmental disabilities or mental weaknesses is categorized as DDD, that's a division of developmental disabilities, and there is a special license for these children. Whether they go to a DDD foster home or a DDD group home, that's not the normal foster care route. Uh, we'll call those the, uh, the elite, the elite trained um, in this battle. How about, how long does it take to get and keep a foster license? Well, the normal time frame is four to six months, depending on the speed at which you complete the paperwork and coursework. A foster license in Arizona is valid for two years. What if the birth parents invade my privacy and threaten me? Are you asking me to coach these parents up? I'm not asking you to do anything. <laughs> But uh, your anon anonymity should be maintained throughout the process of foster parenting when it comes to your relationship with the birth parent who may or may not have regular weekly visitation. The state encourages shared parenting, and that always starts slow with something like a note of encouragement in the diaper bag when the child goes on a visit. These visits are usually two hours per week, uh, two hours, two visits, um, so twice a week, or four hours once per week, unless the parent fails to repeatedly make the appointment. And then, what about the, the pain, the difficulty? Tell me the truth, David. Well, the truth is fostering is not forever, and fostering is not for everyone. Foster care is not congregate care. A safe home is almost always better than a safe group home. But as the need is steady and consistent, the new recruits are needed to enter the battle. Also, there's a honeymoon phase, uh, they say, I've seen, in foster care. Children are placed in the home, and they may be on their best behavior for a few weeks, and then, when trust begins to be built, boundaries begin to be tested. So that's reality. The honeymoon phase. You realize, oh, they are sinners in need of a savior. Foster care is not for the faint of heart. Strain upon the marriage, family, and relationships is real. This is certainly a reality in 
in any addition to any home, particularly a child who has suffered trauma. All trials, we must remember, have an intended purpose by God, two of which are worth the strain. They're worth the pain. One of those purposes is that all of these things, 2 Corinthians 1.9 says, different, various afflictions, difficulties, all these things make us rely upon God and not ourselves. In other words, they increase our dependence upon God who raises the dead. The second is that various trials produce endurance, steadfastness, Christ-likeness, This is the pathway to God's goal for my life. And this one from the heart of a mother. Reunification after X months. That's a heartbreak too big to bear, David. Well, it is a heartbreak. And God is greater than our hearts. It is a heartbreak. And God is the one who binds up the brokenhearted. There is no scriptural warrant for holding back on love due to the extreme level of discomfort. You know, you know the healer of your heart. They do not. That's an Aaron Britton quote. There are also so many blessed benefits the benefit of family bonding and family building, experiencing the joy of meeting an urgent need for a troubled time in a child's life, being used by the master in this good work, a very practical display of selfless love. It's not just you, it's all in your household. Everybody's involved and it bonds. There's also lifelong lessons. Think of this, a a temporary sacrifice, but a lifelong lesson. We've all had different trials in our life that have been light momentary afflictions, and they're gone. And yet, we learned lessons for life that last. But lifelong lessons, marriage is sanctifying, parenting is sanctifying, Having a little or big foster brother or sister is sanctifying. This is an adventure of faith building and faith made manifest as foster parents trust our all wise and always good God with the path of each foster care journey. Another blessing is that fruit bearing is almost guaranteed regardless of response, regardless of bonding, acceptance or rejection of your parental love God can grow you through foster care. As you faithfully do whatever he's called you to do, faithfulness is fruitfulness. There's also the blessing of one way to obey the Great Commission, to evangelize, to sow seeds. What will be done in next generation ministries in just a few minutes. Christians don't have to stop being Christians when an unbeliever comes under their household and parental care. This is a wonderful gospel opportunity to plant seeds of truth of God's word over time and trust him with the results. There are gospel opportunities with those involved in the child's life, such as home visits by the DCS overworked caseworker, uh, practicing hospitality to her or him, or team meetings for the child, or foster parent events. There's also what we all hope for in those that we love, in our household, in our neighborhood, salvation and discipleship. Some will come to believe the gospel in your home and come under your discipleship and come into the household of faith here at GBC. Just as the body helps the body grow, consider the beauty of a body of GBC not only being a support to you, but being an ongoing partner in a discipleship of the child who is granted new life in Christ as a child in your home. So now what? 
Foster or bust? Uh, no. Heart enlargement or bust. <laughs> Remember where we started. Our God is a father to the fatherless. He is also the father of mercies and God of all comfort. 2 Corinthians 1.3. The focus is growth in your imitation of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Seek the Lord if you are hidden in Christ to enlarge your heart to run in the way of his commandments. Say, Lord, show me opportunities to express your heart of compassion as I go to church today. Oh, somebody has two bags in their hands. I'm going to run to the door to open the door for that person, for my beloved brother or sister in Christ. The Lord sees the tiniest of details. Ask the Lord to grow your heart of compassion. Consider carefully. Gather more information. Carefully consider what would be most pleasing to the Lord in an ongoing way. It's very common for people who actually do step into foster care, who do sign up for classes, that it's a year or two or three of thinking about, praying about, talking about, considering, seeing other foster families um, before they take that step. So carefully consider. Pray and meditate. Let your heart be grounded in God's word to walk in his ways. To serve the Lord with gladness wherever, whenever, however he would have you serve. Perhaps take to heart an aspect of mercy or compassion and self-sacrifice that you have suppressed. That, that the Lord in his kindness may be spurring you on to zealously go after. Hold it all up to the light of God's word. And hold the rope. This was an illustration of William Carey. It was spoken of in this book. I'm going to read this short paragraph. Hold the rope. We're to do good to everyone, especially to those of the household of faith. Galatians 6.10 says. So, reading from The Hospitality Commands by Alexander Strout. A story is told about William Carey, one of the best-known early missionaries to India, when Andrew Fuller said to him, there's a gold mine in India, but it seems almost as deep as the center of the earth. William Carey immediately replied, I will venture down, but remember that you must hold the ropes. And then Alexander says, hosting and assisting the Lord's servants is one way we can support or hold the ropes for those who venture out as messengers of the good news of Christ. So supporting foster families, supporting adoptive families, this is a way that you can perhaps consider participating to provide for them in normal and extraordinary hospitable ways. There's actually something called a respite care license, which is the exact same process for a foster care license. You go through all the same steps, but it's so that you are a licensed respite family, so that if that family gets to have that vacation and wants to regroup with their own children, biological children, there is a safe, loving, respite foster home for their foster children. They want to leave their foster children with you so that they can come back renewed and refreshed to continue the day after day, month after month care for foster children. So I think that would be radical. Somebody saying, I want to get licensed as a respite family to start off with, to provide respite, and I get paid for it. Big bucks. It's almost 88 cents an hour. <clears throat> so, so these are some of the ways. And then um, find opportunities to step forward, I, I, I would love to have conversation with you one-on-one, -on -one, um, by phone, by text, uh, by email, david at gbcaz.org. Um, again, as I said, I'm kind of double dipping. This is, 
This is what I do for my vocation, for my job payment outside of the church is as a foster care licensing worker for a Christian organization. Uh, but also I love my beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and uh, if you know me, I, I'm not a salesman. I, I don't... Uh, being a foster parent is not something that is at the top of our conversation. Like, oh, don't talk to David again. He's going to be talking about that old foster care thing. Um, I just want to help you, pray for you, pray with you. So I'm going to end with uh, Titus 3.14. Paul ends his letter to Titus in this way. This was preached um, as we went through Titus by Scott Maxwell. Titus 3.14 says, And let our people, Titus, let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. So if Paul was talking, when he talked about urgent need, the, the major context was gospel advancing needs throughout the world. But good works, Paul said throughout this letter and beyond, are what Christians ought to be fit for. Colossians 1, uh, first Titus, not first Titus, Titus 1.16. We should be fit for good works. They're what his servants are to be a model of, Titus 2.7. And they're what we ought to be zealous for, Titus 2.14. And in 3.8 and 3.13, he reminds us to be careful to devote ourselves to good works. As a man who's a father, an NGM deacon, a teacher, a former foster father, and now blessed to call myself the adoptive father of five wonderful sons, I can say that there is much gospel opportunity in this ministry of foster care, just as there is a father and an NGM teacher. But looking at this passage, these things must be learned. There's an intention in learning. There's a humility necessary to be teachable. And we must learn how to do what? To devote ourselves to good works. Devote, to give special attention to, to stand before, to do something with diligence. And we're called to devote ourselves to good deeds. One thing we can all take from this is to never forget the gospel opportunities before us and to be devoted to them as specific good works to pay special attention to. And to what purpose? That we would not be unfruitful. This doesn't necessarily mean fruitless. This unfruitful word is the same used in Mark 4, the parable of the sower and the four soils. The seed that fell among the weeds grew. It grew. And it was choked out, diminished in a significant way by the weeds. What were these weeds? Mark 4.19 says, They are the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things. They enter in and they choke the word and it proves unfruitful. So we're all on a lifelong journey of discerning what now, Lord, would be most pleasing in your sight for me to do or for me and my household. As we continue to discuss this urgent need and others, may your heart be inclined not to a sad story or even a child with, without a place to call home, but a great God, a merciful God, a God who reached down into your life, believer, when you were helpless, when you were hopeless, when you were running from him and had mercy on you. He inclined your heart to him. He saved you. He rescued you. What, when, you, when we remember that, what, what would we not do for this God? How could we not have the, the Hanani attitude, the here am I, here am I, Lord. What would you have for me to do? May we make the most of our time and the opportunities God has given and will give to us. Let's pray. Our great merciful God, we ask that you would pave the way and show 
each one of us the way we can join in your glorious cause of gospel proclamation. That we, the beholders of truth and recipients of your undeserved mercy, would go with light and love and compassion, eager to meet pressing needs in the church and in this world, and that this church would be fertile ground for love and open arms and compassion, period. Compassion, Lord, for women who have found themselves with child, for widows in need of support and encouragement, for fatherless and for foster children in our midst. In Jesus' name. Amen.